scientist flown in from Nagpur, National Environment Engineering Research Institute, who will share her thoughts with the other panelists. And I would like to uh, ask the video people in the interest of time. We have a participation from Dr. Ernest Vaughan from Switzerland. If you can just play his one minute video while the guests are getting ready on the panel in the interest of time. And I hand over to Dr. Atya. Thank you, Arpreet. Uh, so, uh, so there we have all our panelists uh, to come. Yeah, uh, just Hello everyone, up. I'm sorry I cannot be with you today in person, but I'm very happy to send you this video greeting. Let me first of all congratulate all of you, because you are spending your time today on a very relevant topic, that of purpose-driven leadership and strong values in business organizations, both of which are close to my heart. Why do I think they are relevant? Why do I think that these two topics, purpose-driven leadership and strong values in business organizations are of such great relevance? Well, it's quite simple. We are confronted as a global community with two macro challenges. The first of those challenges is the environmental challenge. Of course, we have all heard of climate change and uh, we're all acutely aware how our planet is changing and how we are, our own activities are hurting the way in which our planet can function and are essentially harming the sustainability of our own way of life. And therefore we need to address this challenge. And when I'm talking about the environmental challenge, it's not only climate change. Climate change may currently be the most uh, prominent on the public agenda. But it is more. We're also talking about um, deteriorating water and air qualities all over the world, especially in big urban centers like where you are right now. We are talking about the um, uh, loss of species and the degradation of, of biodiversity. And we're talking about a whole bundle of environmental issues that we need to address as the number one a global challenge that we're confronted with. And secondly, I want to introduce the distributional challenge. And distribution, of course, first of all, we think about income. But again, it is more. It is more profound than just how much income do individuals receive. The distributional challenge is very much about opportunities in life. How do we distribute fairly and equitably uh, distribution in life uh, for uh, people all over the planet, in different societies, in different communities, this challenge prevails. And now both of these challenges uh, share uh, one characteristic, which is that they need to be addressed, and that the longer we wait, the more the cost will be to find the solutions. So we'd be smart and we'd be well advised to address them rather sooner than later, both on the environmental and the distributional challenge we need to move ahead and we can move ahead. We have solutions ready in the shelf. We have a lot of smart people working and thinking towards finding solutions. We have people like you sitting in the room today who are thinking about actions they can take, about concrete ways of delivering mechanisms that will allow for a more sustainable and more equitable planet. And therefore, I think uh, it is great that you've come together today and, and to, to work on these topics. Now, as I say, both of these challenges we can and we will address, but for both of these challenges, and there I come back to the topic of purpose-driven leadership and strong values in business, both of these challenges we will only be able to address successfully if business steps up its role in finding solutions and delivering those solutions to a wide public. The ingenuity, the creativity, the agility of private sector organizations, of businesses is unmatched and we would be very, very, um, uh, you know, not wise to, to leave aside business organizations as strong actors in finding and delivering those solutions. So because of these, uh, this, this context of having two macro challenges which we need to address, which we can address and I'm sure we will address successfully, we need to be aware that business has a role to play therein and how can business play a more productive role in finding solution to these challenges? Well, first and foremost, by purpose-driven leadership and strong values in business organizations. So therefore, 
Once again, thank you very much for uh, listening to this short video. Congratulations on joining this conference today and spending your time, investing your time in thinking and consequently acting on these challenges. And together we will succeed in making a more sustainable and more equitable planet. Thank you very much and bye bye. Good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, you just heard uh, Dr. Ernst Vaughan, who spoke about the environment. Uh, that is something very close to my heart, being a scientist working in the area of the environment. Uh, but more about that a little later. Uh, I would like to uh, invite on the dais the esteemed panelists of this session, uh, Dr. Urvashi Makar, Rishabh Alap Singh, can you see him in the audience, Rishabh, yeah, uh, Shrimati Samriti Shur, and Dr. Neeta Bali. Dr. Neeta Bali, unfortunately, we will be uh, missing her. So, a warm welcome to the panelists, and uh, let's start this session. Uh, this has a really long title, actually, you know. The role of science, environment, technology, education, using spiritual energy towards a unified vision of sustainability and peace. I really must thank uh, Harpreet for inviting me to this uh, wonderful event. Uh, I am a scientist, uh, like I said earlier, and uh, science and spirituality, uh, even though this concept has been in with me for a very long time. I have really never joined the two like what Harpreet has been doing. And uh, so I'm really happy to be here and listen to all the lectures that went before me that actually showed, you know, proof of connecting this, uh, especially Dr. Mohit who uh, spoke about this cardiologist. And uh, I see so many uh, people, uh, this is a forum which is very different from my normal scientific uh, gatherings and uh, you know I met these two young beautiful girls uh, outside today and I was so impressed that uh, at this young age they have found a direction which uh, you know many people at, uh, who are much older have uh, are still you know wondering and looking at that. Uh, so uh, science and spirituality uh, when Harpreet invited me for this about uh, two months ago, she had called me and said, would you be free on the 16th of October, you know, just block your date, I want you to come and uh, attend this. Uh, so the first thing that, you know, came to my mind when she said all this was all these Dan Brown novels and all this fiction, you know, that we read about, the, you know, the science and the church always being at loggerhead and all those stories, you know, actually uh, got refreshed in my mind. And uh, but but when you think at a larger uh, or uh, you know scope of this uh, beyond all that, and uh, then you realize you know that if you just think about uh, the Earth you know, orbiting around the Sun and all the planets, you know if gravity was just a little bit here and there, it would have all collapsed. But uh, what is it that keeps all this working so smoothly? So you realize that there is some being that is more powerful than uh, what we are thinking of. And keeping all this together is our environment. Uh, as a scientist working in the area of the environment, I can really tell you uh, with great regret actually that this is always the last thing on the agenda of any scientific forum. You know, we are always given the last priority, even though, you know, now everybody talks of climate change and, uh, you know, extreme weather events and things like that. But uh, 
managing the environment has uh, never very sadly been a priority you know in india uh, you will be really surprised to know that in majority of our cities 60% of the wastewater that we generate and i'm not talking of industrial the domestic wastewater is not treated our most of our cities have a capacity to treat only 40% of this domestic wastewater that comes out of all our homes the remaining 60% just flows down the drains and meets the nearest water body it could be a river it could be a lake it could be anything so i do not think that there is even one lake or river in this country of us which is actually so blessed with natural resources we have contaminated every single natural resource it's not just water it's degraded land it's the air quality you know and why because we have never paid attention to our environment you know bacteria uh, when the earth began 4 million years ago so the only living being that survived from there to today is the bacteria and why because they have the genetic capability to adapt to the surroundings so when something becomes a pollutant the bacteria changes its genetic makeup and uh gets that ability to be able to degrade that <coughs> polluted you know how many man made chemicals have come up from when the earth was incepted so this is how they have survived over the years over all the uh, what should i say insults that we have given to the environment so you know you can think of them like a role model we live today in such a stressful world uh, you heard our uh, cardiologist friend just before me and uh, he gave us such a beautiful example of you know uh, how we can actually deal with it and our genetic makeup actually changes uh, it immediately made me think of how you know our bacteria i work with bacteria so this is why i relate everything into that uh, direction so spirituality to me you know as someone working in the environment is you know until you uh, do not form a system where your ecosystem is not disturbed you cannot actually really find a sustainable living you know what is sustainable living sustainable living is when you are at harmony with the natural resources that you have around you but uh, we are so intent on destroying this entire uh, ecosystem that how can we talk of sustainable living the carrying capacity of a land is something that we have really crossed that threshold very long back and these two uh, sentences i would like to share with all of you also which have been uh, experts of some famous uh, poem veh path kya पथिक कुशलता क्या वह पथ क्या पथिक कुशलता क्या जिस पथ पर बिखरे शूल न हो नाविक की धैर्य परीक्षा क्या यदि धाराएं प्रतिकूल न हो एंड आई एम वेरी श्योर द स्टूडेंट्स हैव टू बी मेड टू लर्न हाउ टू फेस चैलेंजेस हाउ टू फेस फेलुअर्स एंड हियर कम्स द रियल रोल ऑफ स्पिरिचुअलिटी एंड योगा ऑफ आर कंट्री एंड आई एम श्योर दैट लिसनिंग टू I am waiting to listen to the viewpoints of the other panelists on this, and then, of course, the discussions will give lot of new reflections to all of us also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you uh, Dr. Irvishi, and now we have uh, Dr. Rishabh Singh. I think he is the executive um, engineer at Amazon. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Prisha, and uh, I'm an engineering manager for Spain. Uh, sorry, for Amazon. Uh, I live in Spain. I just want to clarify that whatever I'm going to say now is my personal opinion, and I don't represent Amazon in any way. That's what they ask me to say whenever I stand on a stage and talk about Amazon. <laughs> um, so 
through through today's conversations, what's what's really kind of coming to my mind is uh, uh, the the idea of ethics and the idea of innovation around it. Um, if you think about Amazon, it's making sales, right? Uh, one one type of sale is deals. We just did the big billion day sale. I hope you guys uh, bought some fun things. There's also the Diwali sale coming up. My management is really stressing me out about that. <laughs> but uh, how does how does ethics work here? So, as someone who works in this company, uh, for me, ethics is if I know you can get this item for a cheaper price, I'll make sure you are aware of that, right? But if I and, and if I know that you're not going to like this particular product based on 1,500 people have bought it before you and they've all returned it, then we'll make sure that we, we don't really advertise that as much, right? But wherever I'm more agnostic is in your actual purchasing of it, right? Because that in the end is, is your decision, right? We're not, we're not forcing you to, to buy that mobile phone or those shirts or etc. We're engineers and uh, we're just trying to make that happen as quickly as possible, right? Um, so whose fault is it, uh, you know, uh, that, that uh, there's all this cargo flying around to ensure items come within one day at the lowest cost possible? Because these things have trade-offs, right? And it's a question that consumers must ask themselves. Uh, as an engineer, uh, I think of it like a, like a I don't know, like a blacksmith, right? We're making we're making swords, right? And we're making swords because people want swords, right? And uh, we'll make sure that the swords work, right? That they're sharp, etc. And uh, we'll make sure that the sword doesn't fall on itself because that would kill the person, and we don't want to kill people, right? But um, um, who do you? So if someone uses that sword to perform, let's say, an, an unethical act. Uh, who do you blame? Do you blame the person who made the sport for enabling them? Or do you blame the person who chose to leverage that for their actions? To me, honestly, I'm a rational person. I feel like the answer is somewhere in between. I feel like to some extent, it's both. But then I have this dilemma as a as an innovator, right? Being like, so then should I just not build things that uh, that could be harmful? But if I did that, um, I don't know how much innovation would have happened in the world thus far, right? If you think about all the innovations we have today, a lot of them have come from a place of like origin in national security, or from a place of origin to kind of solve some type of urgent, urgent, urgent need, right? I was just talking to ma'am earlier uh, today uh, who had a great talk uh, from the DRDO yesterday. Um, so GPS, we all use Google Maps, right? And Google Maps has objectively made our lives better, right? But uh, GPS, global positioning system, comes from from the need, you know, for a certain government to, to, to observe what's happening in the world. Right uh, for for benefits of national security, it's just that we moved on from this, so now it can be used for other purposes. Right, so uh, people use surveillance for for bad things. Should that mean that we don't in create surveillance at all? I don't know. Uh, you know, but this is a question for 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 I guess all of us to all of us to think. Uh, I'm not going to pretend like I know the answers. Uh, I'm attending these conferences, so I can learn it myself. <laughs> but I think uh, my thoughts here are, uh, for at least problems that we do know, uh, let's let's create them as constraints, right? As we innovate. Uh, one one place that I'm really proud of of Amazon is uh, I'm sure you've heard of the pra the, the Paris Agreement to reduce uh, carbon emissions by a certain extent by 2050. Um, by the way, I don't even think that's enough, but, but at least that's something. And Amazon's taken the commitment to deliver the Paris Accord to, uh, within their company 10 years earlier, right? And that 10 years earlier, I hope we achieve it, but it's, it's, a, it's a call of urgency and it's a call to, to, to start innovating, right, along these lines. So 
it starts uh, it starts asking us like I gave an example of deals earlier, right? But lowest price and we know customers don't like it. Maybe another angle here is right um, if we know that if we know somehow that that this delivery is going to cost ten times the emissions of some other one, should we should we increase the relevance of it, right? Uh, I've seen uh, very recently Google has started uh, uh, prevent, uh, started showing sustainable or eco-friendly routes, which is uh, car routes that will use less emissions, right? Um, I also saw earlier today, you know, earlier this week, that uh, there's there's a lot of uh, innovations happening around cleaning up the Pacific garbage patch, and while they've only cleaned like 0.1 percent of it, it validates a proof of concept which can be scaled. Uh, at infinitum, and they believe now that they can clear the garbage patch in 10 years, right? So uh, maybe have a more optimistic view here, uh, because I, I do see a lot of uh, a lot of change happening. Uh, but the change, the reason why the change is happening, to drag my original point, is because the the demand for it has started coming from you guys, right? So while I thank you uh, for giving me the permission to optimize in these directions. Um, I do. I do hope that you guys have a louder voice here, so that we can continue to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Rishabh. You know what amazes me about this generation is like their supreme confidence. You know, the way he just walked around the stage, and I was just thinking, when I was that age, would I have ever? had the courage to just walk up and down and talk to an audience. I don't think that would have ever happened. So congratulations. Now this is an uh, interaction that I have been waiting for ever since uh, Harpreet shared the draft program with me uh, because she's going to talk about the metaverse. You know, I mean, at least I think she works in that area. And uh, you know, ever since uh, it started flashing on my Facebook page, I've been wondering what it is. So I'm very eager to listen to Mrs. Sabriti Shu. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to add, uh, you may not be aware, she is a harps angel. They are all harps angels. And that's why they're here. They're committed to the purpose. You may not be aware because they're not introducing themselves that way. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harpreet. So, Dr. Harpreet, by the way, thank you very much for this platform. She is my role model. Not just because of where she is today, professionally, but as a person. She is the kind of person I want to be. She's so grounded. She has achieved so much. And she's still doing these amazing things and making such a great Exciting. You all will interact. What do you think my age is? 
Any guesses? It could be anything. It, and you can shout it out. Nobody will judge you. Actually, that's accurate. <laughs> I and by the way, I became 22 four days ago. So yeah, happy birthday to me. <laughs> so I started working when I was 15. I was still in school at that time, and my grandfather passed away. So I had to take on some parts of the family business because our business is related to defense, aviation, aerospace, something we are into hard component manufacturing and we cannot depend on people outside of the business because of the nature of it. So we bring in people from the family. We have a family, we have a very big family, we come from a joint family. And a few years back, uh, not, not two years back, a year back, I ventured into this field of metaverse and I started working, have, like, I have my own startup at the moment, it's called the House of Griffin. And, okay, by the way, Griffin, don't judge it by the name, Griffin is basically an abbreviation from uh, Kryptonium Fintech Private Limited, so you, you take Griff from that and Fin from that, it becomes Griffin, so that's it. And Metaverse is a very amazing and exciting field for everyone. It is a place where whatever you can imagine, you can be. It is very much this way in the real world as well. But a lot of times, you know, people don't really believe that. But if you don't believe that in the metaverse, you cannot really achieve it. It's a virtual world. And everything that you want to be, or you can, you have imagined yourself to be, you can be that in the exact same form, in the exact same way you want it to be. If you want to fly, you can fly instead of walking in the metaverse.